Well, let's turn now then to the Word of God. The same passage that we'll be looking at, Lord willing, all three of the sessions I have the privilege of preaching. 1 Thessalonians and chapter 2. I'm going to read the first 12 verses again and briefly pray. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts." For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. For laboring day and night, that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preached to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Let's pray. Eternal Father, we come to you in the name of your beloved Son and our beloved Saviour, Jesus Christ, depending upon the Holy Spirit to give us right desires. We ask, O God, that helped in our praying thus, that you would receive us for your Son's sake and in accordance with the love that you have toward us in him that you would now bless us as we study your word. Help us to see the the very spirit of Christ in the words and exhortations of your servant Paul. We pray, O God, that we may take to heart this rich, sweet model of pastoral ministry, of ministerial faithfulness that is set before us, that you would teach us by your spirit, through your word, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Woolen and Pastor Espinoza have been a blessing to my soul and I hope to yours. Our hearts, I trust, have been stirred by the things that we have heard about life on the edge of the promised land, about our duty, responsibility, privilege to be faithful in preaching the word of God and bringing the good news of salvation to all people. And there is, without for one moment pulling back anything that we have heard in any of these sessions, as we've been exhorted to to be strong and of good courage, as we've seen that we need to be faithful men, not buckling, not diluting, but standing firm and holding fast, there is a danger that we will fall into a certain wrong response. We are called to serve as Christ, with Christ-like integrity, sincerity, humility, and purity. And it is good for us to be stirred up to think about what it means to be faithful in our own generation, to serve our God today in the place where God has put us. But the danger is that 
in, in feeling this urgency that we will respond in an unbalanced way. Have you ever heard it said that to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail? You understand what that means? When you've been given a big hammer, you want to use it. Everything looks like a nail. And when we are exhorted to faithfulness, to clarity, to distinctness, to conviction, it might be that we slide towards a kind of hardness or harshness. A clear-eyed, warm-hearted orthodoxy can become a cold-eyed formalism, even a hardness or a harshness. I think there are some particular dangers for us if we live in feminized or matriarchal societies. Because when we are exhorted to behave ourselves like men, we might become caricatures of masculinity. Uh, me man! And we tell people with a certain kind of hardness, with a, with a hyper-masculinity, in a way that is not always distinctly Christ-like. We become a sort of a reformed robocop. We don't even need to look, we just have to shoot. And there's a danger then in becoming a pastor who has lost sight of the whole breadth of the character of a faithful minister of God. Paul has called us to serve like Christ, to imitate Christ just as he imitates Christ. The beautiful liberation of a man who serves God rather than men, who lives before the face of God and so doesn't need to fear the face of men. But when Paul starts to press home what that actually looks like, he uses these two particular metaphors. He says, when I discharge my ministry faithfully, I look like a mother and I look like a father. Now again, we need to be careful here because we cannot rely on human imagination or experience to tell us everything we need to know about mothers and fathers. You might have had a delightful Christian mother or you might have had an ungodly mother. If I say to some people, that God is a father to you, that does not fill them with joy and comfort and security, but with terror. Because their experience of being fathered is not a right reflection of what God is in himself. And so when we say that a pastor needs to be like a mother, we must take God's definition of what a true mother is like and not slide into imagining that perhaps the excesses or the mistakes, the extremes to which our mothers or other mothers we know may have gone to become our model. And that's very important, again, in the, uh, the environment where I minister. Too often, mothers become what are called enablers, that means they're always making excuses for their children. So I recall ministering to a young man, a very needy young man who got himself into a whole heap of trouble. And I remember going to his home on more than one occasion, and if he wasn't in, I would, I would speak to his mother, and his mother would always tell me, he's a good boy. The problem is always someone else. If only he had this... If only this happened to him. If only you would give him this. If only somebody would take more time. He would be fine. He's good. There's nothing wrong with him. Have you ever had this sort of situation where you've got a, a, a kid who's trying to kill their brother or sister and the mum is looking there. This happens in the, in the United Kingdom. I don't know if it happens in the Philippines. And the mum was, he's hungry. He's a little bit hungry. Now, he's a lot sinful. 
That's why he's trying to kill his brother or sister. Yeah, he may be a bit hungry, but that's just excusing his sin. It may help to explain why he's behaving like that, but you're not actually dealing faithfully with him. You're indulging your son or your daughter by excusing their sin. You are enabling them to continue their pattern of bad behavior. That's not the kind of mothering that Paul has in mind here. And so we need to make sure that when we look at these metaphors, what does it mean to be faithful like a mother? What does it mean, tomorrow God willing, to be faithful like a father? We shouldn't be overreacting to the errors and excesses that we see around us in our society. We should also not feel that there is a tension between loving like a mother and loving like a father. As if sometimes you have to be like a mother and other times you're going to be a father. As if you're wearing two masks and taking them on and off. No, Paul says that as a pastor there's a consistency between what it means to be faithful like a mother to her children and faithful like a father to her, his children. So the other thing to take account of here is, do we need to wait? Has is, 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 is everything failed? Or can I keep going? Just the lights? Okay, fantastic. Um, so the third thing to take account of is... Sorry, I've lost my thread now. Ah, yes, that's the other thing I wanted to say. That there is no... We shouldn't feel that our masculinity is being threatened by behaving like mothers. Okay, you can... You've heard about courage and strength and determination. And that is what you will need as men to love like mothers. If you've got wives who are faithful mothers to children, you will appreciate the vigor, the strength, the commitment, the sacrifice that that requires. Brothers, it is not soft and easy for us as men of God to love God's people and to be faithful to them as mothers with their children. And so what we've got here in 1 Thessalonians and chapter 2 is Paul saying, notice from verse 7, that we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preached to you the gospel of God. So now we've got then, in contrast to that image that Paul painted for us that we studied yesterday, where you've got this self-serving, self-seeking, brow-beating, aggressive demanding, so-called pastor. You've got now this image of sacrificial love. The image of gentleness. And I think that gentleness has become an overlooked pastoral virtue. I have become persuaded of this personally. I have had to ask these questions of myself as a man and as a minister. But I think, remember, that the Apostle Paul would say to Timothy that his gentleness was to be something that was distinct and evident in his labors. And it should be the same with us. And again, in a fallen world where feminism and a more matriarchal attitude has gripped not just society at large, but the church of Jesus Christ as well, when we've been too much conformed to the world, and when we're saying to our men, act like men, step up, and we're trying to show an example of what that looks like, that we can veer then to the opposite extreme. So when Paul says, love like a mother, be faithful like a mother, he is not exhorting us to a kind of sentimentality or indulgence, 
but to a spirit of sacrificial love that is exemplified by the way that a mother relates to her children. Now there's a danger here as well, that we might feel that to do this, we will be taken advantage of. You may have to deal with people who are difficult in your church. And when you feel that you are going to be humble, when you are seeking to be gracious, when you are ready to show this kind of loving spirit, do you not sometimes fear that people will take advantage of you? That if if you're the man who's willing to love, if you're the man who's willing to show humility, if you're someone who's willing to risk being taken advantage of, that there are plenty of people who will gladly take advantage of you. And brothers, this then is not about becoming foolish, but it is part of what it means to be fools for the sake of Jesus Christ. So I exhort you to take a righteous risk in this regard and to pursue not so much a Paul-like disposition, but as we shall see, I trust, a Christ-like disposition in these things. Notice then how Paul begins to develop this metaphor of the mother. We were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Paul is trying to emphasize here the closeness of the bond that exists between the pastor and the congregation for whom he cares. So he does not say, we were like a nursery worker. He does not say, we were like a child care provider. He does not even say, we were like a Christian compassion ministry's house mother. Now, I am not diminishing, especially in that last case, the kind of sacrificial love and care that some of these people pour into their responsibility. But there have been times when I have gone as a parent on a school trip because the school has said we would like some parents to come with us to help look after the children. Now, there are, I don't know, 25 or 30 children in that class. And I might be given responsibility for five or six of them. Now, suppose that all of a sudden the children in that class come into some kind of danger. I have a particular responsibility for six and some responsibility for 30. But if there's a real danger, where does my eye and my heart go first? To my child. I can't help that. I'm I'm the parent. My instinct is always going to be to the children who are distinctly my own. I hope not to be careless about the others, but all my natural affection and attachment is primarily toward my own sons and daughters. You know, don't you, if you have children of your own, there might be 20 of them making a noise. Do you know the sound of your own child crying? Yes. They might all be crying, or most of them, and then all of a sudden you go, oh, hang on, that's mine. Why? It's the ear of a parent. And quite likely, your wife's ear is even more finely tuned than yours. Did your wife ever find it frustrating when you had very young children that you could sleep through anything, but as soon as she heard her child's voice, she would wake up in the night? And she would often be the one, perhaps you're a more gracious and loving and sensitive husband than I was, But I could sleep through, eventually, the crying of my children. But my wife would always hear. She had an ear that was tuned to the cries of her own children. And that's what the Apostle is emphasizing. Like a nursing mother, when the child is at its most vulnerable and needy and dependent with her own children. This then, my friends, is not a professional attachment but a personal one. 
We are not hirelings, but we are shepherds. We are not childcare workers, having children around us because that's our job. We are pastors of the flock. We are like nursing mothers with our own children. We cannot just put this baby in the corner while we do something more important. Our lives are governed by an awareness and an affection and an attachment that is most like that of a nursing mother with her own children. And Paul says then that in terms of ministerial faithfulness, that personal, maternal affection, attachment, awareness works out in several ways. In verse 8, it's concern. A mother's concern so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. That first phrase, affectionately longing for you. Again, profound attachment and personal interest that produces a desire and an intention to do good to somebody. An appetite to be a blessing to somebody. We were well pleased, therefore, to impart to you these good things. It's the language of deliberate commitment. The, the false teachers in Thessalonica, the accusers of Paul, remember, Paul's saying this because he's being accused by other people who want to divide him from the men and women who are following Christ in Thessalonica. And they're accusing Paul of these kinds of things that we looked at yesterday. And they're saying, in effect, Paul wants you, you know. Paul wants to get his hands on you. Paul wants to get a grip on you. Now, can you imagine saying that to a mother? Or a child of a mother? But you wouldn't say it like that, would you? You'd say, your mother wants you. Your mother wants to get her hands on you. Your mother wants to get a grip on you. And that's the language of affection. That's the language of maternal concern. Paul would have said, yes, absolutely I want you. Absolutely I want to get my hands on you. Absolutely I want to get a grip on you. But always and only for the best reasons. I want to lavish affection upon you. I want to do good toward you. I have an affectionate longing for you. Like a child running out of school at the end of the day and mum is waiting by the school gates. And what do you do? The mum reaches down with her open arms so that the child can run into the warm embrace. There's affectionate longing. I haven't seen you all day and now is my chance to wrap my arms around you once again. And that's what Paul says the pastor's heart should be toward the people of God. And they should know that. Can you imagine affectionate longing that someone is not aware of? Would you want your wife to know that you have an affectionate longing for her? You have to tell her. And you have to show her, brothers, do we both cultivate and communicate a de deep desire for the good of our people? Do the saints you serve know that you love them? How do you refer to them? Have you ever told them of your affectionate longing for them and your deep desire to do them good. When they look at the way that you speak to them and about them, when they think of the way that you act toward them, when they think of your face when you see them, do they interpret you as having an affectionate longing to do them good? There's a mother's concern. There's also a mother's generosity. Notice how Paul goes on. Affectionately longing for you. We have this deep concern to do you good. 
So we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Mothers are givers. Paul says we were ready, like mothers, to give you the gospel. In the same way as a mother does all that she can to give her beloved children what is needful and best. So Paul says, I will give you the gospel. That's the best thing I have for you. I want you to know Christ and Him crucified. As we heard earlier, the whole ministry should be evangelical. That's not an empty word. Everything we do should be soaked and saturated with the beauties and the glories of the Jesus who died for His people and rose again and ascended on their behalf and who now pleads for them and is coming again for them. Paul says, what else would I tell you? And remember, he's not actually speaking here to them as unconverted sinners, but as men and women who know Christ Jesus. I came to you, first of all, to tell you about Him. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, even Jesus who is delivering us from the wrath which is to come. And I will keep speaking Christ to you. I will always impress the Lord Christ in all His beauty and majesty as the revealer of God, as the channel in and through whom all the love of the Godhead flows towards you. I have nothing higher, nothing sweeter, nothing richer, nothing purer, and nothing better than a crucified Christ to offer to you as sinners even once you have been saved by grace. I will give you the most spiritually sweet and nutritious food that I am able to give you. When mothers feed their children, do they give them what they want or what they need? Let me correct that. Should they give them what they want or what they need? What happens if a mother only feeds her children what they want? That child's going to get very unhealthy very quickly because they're going to want lots of fast food, typically. They're going to want lots of sugary treats. They might want to eat ice cream for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner. They will demand things that satisfy their appetites but do not provide nutrition for their bodies. So what does mum serve? She gives them vegetables. She provides fruit also. She doesn't just give them the, the chemically enhanced things. The, you know, there are some foods, I think we wouldn't need these lights. They glow in the dark by themselves. They're so unnatural. Mothers don't feed their children a diet of that kind of food. They do not feed what they want, but what they truly need. Because in a healthy maternal relationship, mum not only knows best, but mum loves enough to give the child not what they demand, but what is best for them. Brothers, do we love God's people enough to give them not just what they want, but actually what they need? Some mothers only love enough to make their children happy. Some mothers love enough to make their children truly healthy. And happiness follows on. Here then is Paul saying, as a mother, I was ready to impart to you the gospel. I gave you the best. We have to believe that if God has called us, God has equipped us, the church has recognized us, if in the light of God's Word we know what it is to be a pastor, my friends, we cannot be dominated by a human agenda. We must preach the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. 
And there may be occasions when the people of God even do not want those things. You will come up against the antagonisms of the world who are pushing back against you. Do you love enough to give people the truth of the gospel? Brothers, when we think of our ministries and when others think of our service, are we givers or are we takers? Paul was accused of being a taker. Paul wanted to underline that he was a giver like a mother. That he was giving the gospel first and foremost. He was not giving people his opinion. He was not giving people what he wanted the Word of God to say rather than what the Word of God did truly say. He wasn't offering a political commentary on the dealings of the day. He wasn't offering them a philosophical discourse about the way the world might be. He was not giving them clever-sounding speeches. So often today, I hear men speaking as if they want to be remembered for saying something clever. That is not loving like a mother. And very often, it just sounds clever, but it is stupid. It's, it's, do, you, do you know what a false dichotomy is? It means someone says, you can either have this, or you can have that. And you say, no, that's not a choice. I don't, I'm not forced to choose between those things. And it sounds very striking. And sometimes you even hear a man preach like that, and it's, he, he says something, and he, he just pauses. And if it's one of those places where they like to clap the preachers, that's what he's waiting for. Oh, well done. Yeah, that was fantastic. So much modern preaching is the equivalent of giving a needy child a bowl of glowing, chemically glowing ice cream when what they need is the richness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our opinions, the things that scratch men's itching ears, it is not faithfulness like a mother to pander to the appetites of the age. It is faithfulness like a mother in a spirit of gospel generosity to preach Christ and Him crucified in all the breadth and the depth and the length and the height of the love of God towards sinners like us. So you have a mother's concern. You have a mother's generosity. And you have a mother's sacrifice. We were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Not just the gospel, but our own lives. Have you ever heard a mother say something like this? Perhaps, again, if you're a father, it may have been your own wife or some other weary, drained troubled, exhausted woman. She might hear this kind of thing. It's not just the food. My mothering does not consist just in providing meals. If it did, that would be wearying enough. But it is a never-ending cycle of investment. I am not a mother when I'm at work between... 9 o'clock and 5 o'clock. I'm not like a childcare worker. The baby comes in at a certain time, I have to look after it for so long, and then I give it back at the end of the day. Mothering is a 24-7 responsibility. It requires so much. And sometimes a mother will say, my life revolves around these children. I don't have a moment for myself. Everything I do is directed toward them. My antennae are constantly twitching because of my young children, my older children. Perhaps they become extremely demanding. They have particular needs at this time. It may be that they get unaware or thankless. At least in Europe and in, in America, 
sadly, it's a caricature that I think has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. But that the teenager who assumes that they are entitled to everything and are obliged for nothing. And they, mum becomes not a caring mother for them, but an impersonal servant. That when you sit down, you get food. That the clothes magically appear in your drawer or on your desk or wherever it may be. I remember hearing a story about a young man who went away to university. And he called his mother up after about a month. And he said, Mum, there's something wrong with this house. He said, yes, son, what, what, what's the problem? He said, there's something funny in the air. Something funny in the air. Yeah, the, the, the house that I'm now living in, there's dust on every surface. Where is this coming from? You know the problem, don't you? When he lived at home, his mum did the cleaning. He never touched a duster in his life. He never wiped up anything. He, he probably expected his clothes to suddenly be said, Mum, I'm dropping them in the corner of the room. And they're not coming back and appearing clean at the end of the day. That, that sense of assumption that you are there for me. It is easy for a faithful mother to be taken advantage of by those who have no conception of the cost of the sacrifice that she is making. Sometimes a mother may say, even in exasperate, this is a thankless task. Ever had a lady say that to you? I've poured myself out. I've given, I've given, I've given. And nobody notices and nobody cares and no one ever says thank you. And it's not right. But it's often the way that things are. And Paul says... I was like a mother toward you. I was willing to impart to you not only the gospel, but my own life. I was ready to pour myself out. I did not only give you the truth, but I gave you myself as a preacher of the truth. Charles Spurgeon used to say uh, once or twice in his preaching, that he said when, when he'd given everything that he could, he would load himself into the cannon and light the, the firing pin. That once he'd preached his heart out, he would preach himself into the congregation and he would end up utterly drained and exhausted. That he would keep on investing. Mothers give their strength for their children. Mothers give their time for their children. Mothers pour out their life for their children. Mothers are ready, proverbially, to give their life to keep their children safe. Do you have the saying here, like a mother bear robbed of her cubs? Have you heard that? The, 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 I think it's in, in North America, I think it is. It may be a grizzly bear or a black bear. But you've got to be very, very careful if you go out at the season when a mother bear has given birth to her cubs. Because you see these little cuddly bears like this. <laughs> and they look almost like teddy bears. And you're very tempted to go up to them and maybe look at them closely and stroke them. And you don't realize that about 20 feet away in the bushes over there is a big, angry mother bear. And she thinks that you are a threat to her babies. And if she thinks that you are a threat to her babies, she will wipe out the threat. Paul says, I'm ready to be like a mother bear with her cubs. People say, Paul wants you. Absolutely, I want you. I am ready to lay down my life in order that you might live. Do you hear something Christ-like in this language? In the concern that is expressed? in the generosity of the giving, in the sacrifice that is in principle made when you become responsible for the care of souls. Brothers, have you reckoned with the cost of ministry? It is not a profession. It is a calling. It is a vocation. 
And you have signed yourselves over to be stewards of the mysteries of God for the glory of Christ and for the sake of the people. And you are ready to die for His sake and for theirs. You will give yourself week after week after week, day after day after day, hour after hour after hour. Do you understand that pastoral ministry will drain you? That pastoral ministry will exhaust you? And I'm not talking about foolish excess. I'm not talking now about the man who's uh, somehow under a, a false burden of guilt and thinks that he has to work for 20 hours of every day. I'm not talking about a man who's perhaps become subject to a legal spirit and always feels that he's not doing enough. Brothers, ordinary pastoral labor will probably shorten your life. You may know men. I can think of at least one or two of whom it could be said after they had been through a particular season of trial. I think of one man, his wife said of him afterwards, there was less of him afterward than there was before. It had cost him so much to stand firm at a particular point of conflict and assault. It diminished him. He never had the same strength of mind and body. Never had the same resilience. Afterwards was more easily tired. Was more deeply emotional. Was more quickly sensitive. Because it had cost him to be faithful at the point at which battle was joined. He had given the people whom he served not only the gospel, but in giving them the gospel had given them his own life also. He had sacrificed of his own strength in order that they might be kept safe. Brothers, when the Apostle Paul, for example, writing to the Philippians, talks about his life, he said, it was a life of sacrifice and I'm like the point now of the drink offering. It's the last element of the sacrificial process. And he says to the Philippians, if I am now being poured out, if this is the last of my strength, if this is the last of my energy, if these are the last of my hours, then I will do that for you. The same language that he uses when the time actually comes, writing his second letter to Timothy, I am now being poured out. Brothers, your whole life is going to be a pouring out. It is going to hurt. It is going to cost. It is going to exhaust you. And I don't think you need to be in pastoral ministry for very long before you begin to feel the weight of faithfulness like a mother if you're being a faithful man. Now we have to ask, don't we, why? <laughs> why would anybody do this? Why would anybody sign on the dotted line if this is the so-called contract? What is a mother's motive? Affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Why, Paul? What brought you to this point? Because you had become dear to us. You had become dear to us. You had become beloved by us. You had become precious to us. You were the ones who filled our hearts with joy and delight. If you go on to chapter 2 and verse 17. But we, brothers, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoured more eagerly to see your face with great desire. That's the language of maternal faithfulness, isn't it? 
That's the same affectionate heart. This is the same spirit, the same disposition. If you are our beloved ones, if you have become precious to us, then no labor or sacrifice is too much in order to do you God's ordained good. And brothers, without love for God and His people, we will not be faithful. We might become formal. We might go through the motions. We might become cold and distant. We might, if we've been wounded or injured, learn to wear armor and to keep people at a distance. But if we love God's people, if our hearts are carried out toward them, if our affections are in every proper sense toward them, then we can be faithful. And as I've tried to say, that is not just Paul-like. That is Christ-like. That is God-like. When my father and mother forsake me, think of the image we've been using. Paul uses the language of maternal love, faithfulness and affection because it is one of the highest kinds of human love that there is. But Paul says it's possible for a mother to forget the child she bore. It's possible for a mother to abandon even the fruit of her own womb. Paul says, I can conceive of that happening. And tragically, we see that all around us. But who never ceases to love? Who never forgets? Who never turns their back upon their people? It is God Himself. Even if the closest and warmest of human relationships should break down, here is affection. And God Himself is not embarrassed to use maternal language to describe His love for His people. Listen to Isaiah 66. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. On her sides shall you be carried and be dandled on her knees. You see the mum who's doing a lot of things with this hand. Or she, well, if she's right-handed, it'll be this hand. And where's the baby? Wedged there. You, know, you see the mothers, even when they put the baby down, they're walking at this angle because they're so used to having the baby on the hip. God says, that's what I was like. Whatever else I was doing, on her sides shall you be carried and be dandled on her knees to be played with, to be lifted up, to be kept safe, to sit on the lap and to look into the eyes of a mother. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. And brothers, that is assuredly not the language of a flawed maternal indulgence or sentimentality. That is an expression of God-like, Christ-like love. Paul has caught that spirit. Paul has learned that from the character of God as it is revealed in Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that if God loves like that, if Christ loves like that, then surely I also must love like that. How can I love these people? Do you not find, brothers, that this is one of the great challenges of your ministry? Do you sometimes think it's easier to love people you don't know very well? Because the more you get to know them, the more you see their unlovelinesses. And yet, who sees all your unloveliness and loves you still? It is your God and your Saviour. He knows the worst. He has seen the depths of the uglinesses of your soul. And He is committed to loving you. He has set His love upon you. And He will not cease to love you. Now having been so loved, are we learning to love others? Can we look at the blood-bought people of God? Can we see them as the ones for whom Jesus Christ has laid down His life? Can we learn to look 
with the eyes of mother-like love and to see something of the Father in them. Again, you may not know this phrase. I remember, do any of you remember Phil Arthur coming here? Phil Arthur's the man I remember using this phrase. Talked about a face that only a mother could love. You think about it? A face that only a mother could love. You may know children like that. You think this is... You know, sometimes when you see babies and everybody goes, oh, they're so cute. And you see one and you go, you, yeah. <laughs> and what does the mother do? Goody, goody, oh, isn't she gorgeous? Isn't she lovely? Not really. <laughs> but in a mother's eyes, only beauty. And children at their most difficult, at their most awkward, at their most obnoxious, in the heart of a true mother, she sees through it. She's not ignorant of it, but she loves in the face of it. Brothers, have we attained to such a love for the people of God so that we will be faithful like a nursing mother of her own children? To some extent, that might be Easy, uh, easier if they are the fruit of our own gospel ministry. When Paul talks about the people who have been born again, born from above, he uses maternal language, doesn't he? I labored for you in birth. <laughs> I was as an evangelist, like a pregnant woman. I wanted to see you born into life. Paul uses these kind of illustrations. Brothers, in our evangelizing, did, did you hear it when you were listening this morning? Pleading, beseeching, seeking that you might be blessed. When we preach the gospel to people, do we sound like we're trying to beat them into heaven? Do we sound like we're harassing them, haranguing them, attacking them, hounding them, driving them towards God? Or are we holding out God in Christ toward them? Do we have this sense and are we communicating this reality that in offering you the gospel, I am offering you the best I have that you might be blessed beyond conception? Do we love then the way a mother loves? Are we faithful the way a mother is faithful? Brothers, let me ask you a couple of questions in conclusion. How do the people you serve think of you toward them? What is your disposition and behavior toward God's people under your care? Because I, th I think they can probably guess. Are you morose? Bitter? Angry? Sour? Do you try to keep yourself to yourself? Do they feel that there is a distance between you? It's not always easy. It might be your your day off, I hope you take one. We have these big supermarkets, lots of aisles. And there are probably times, I hope I'm not the only one who feels like this, you're going through the supermarket, you turn up an aisle, and you see someone from the church coming down the opposite direction, you go, oh. <laughs> and you hope they haven't seen you, and you go into another aisle, and trust me, you know, I, I, just, I just don't want to do this today. Do they know that you try and avoid them? What might love do under those circumstances? Not put a false smile on, but put a true smile on. It's one of God's people, one of Christ's sheep. 
one of my beloved ones. You think of some of the timid people in your congregation. Do they feel safe with you? Some of the troubled people. How are the children of the congregation with you? Are the children scared of you? Do you not have any time for them? Now, there are probably in your congregation, if it's of any size, some people who do not have a healthy outlook. They don't know how to interpret faithful love. And you may have to work particularly hard to communicate this to them. They may be so troubled, so twisted, that any expression of affectionate concern is easily misinterpreted. But I'm talking about the normal run of things. Are you communicating to the saints a maternal faithfulness that is grounded in love? Does that come across in the way that you preach from the pulpit? We have to labor at this. I'm big and ugly. Most of you aren't as big as I am. I won't comment on your ugliness. <laughs> but brothers, what do we look like when we're preaching? What do we look like when we're at the door of the church building? Have you ever smiled when you preach? Did any of you ever see the, the movie Shrek? <laughs> Remember when he tried smiling at the beginning? <laughs> Didn't come naturally to him. Do you smile at people? Does your face light up? Is your home open? Is your hand open? Is there a spirit of affectionate regard? Do the people of God see, hear, and know from the healthiest and the most vigorous down to the most timid, the most fearful, and the most troubled that you love them and are ready to give yourself for them? That if they ask for a few minutes of your time, you'll give them. And some of them you'll know it's, it's not a few minutes. <laughs> it's a couple of hours. And still you say yes. Do they know that when they're in hospital, you will come to see them? Do they know that when they're sick, you will call them? Do they know that when you're grieving, they're grieving, you will comfort them? Do they know that when they're hungry, you will feed them. Are they so confident of your love that even if you have to serve them a diet of raw vegetables for a few weeks, they will understand that it is so that they may grow strong in Christ Jesus. How do we live toward the saints? How do we speak to them? How do we act toward them? May I also ask, brothers, how do we speak about them? In some senses, this is a very relaxing environment for us if we're pastors, isn't it? Because we're amongst brothers who understand what it is to serve in the, the sphere that we serve. But what's your temptation? What I hear at a lot of pastors' conferences, and this is not an accusation, it may have been entirely different here, but almost this sort of pastoral one-upmanship, oh, this happened in my congregation, ha, huh. well, this happened in my, well, that's nothing to what's been going on in mine. You should meet this elder that I've got to deal with. You should deal with this family that I've got. And we start swapping stories about how frustrating, how wearisome, how tiresome these people are that we have to look after. 
Now, I'm not saying that a loving mother never in exasperation and weariness needs somebody, never needs somebody to whom they can unburden their souls. And there's a safety in being able to talk to men who understand the cost that we're sharing together. But brothers, are the words that come out of our mouths a reflection of what started to happen in our hearts? Of resentment, bitterness, anger. Who are these people? Who do they think they are? Don't they know what they've got? Don't they understand their privilege? Why are they so thankless? Why do they take me for granted? Why don't they realize? The servant of God had words in his mouth from Isaiah, I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Did they understand when Christ went to the cross for them? Did they understand the sacrificial love of their Savior? Brothers, it is no new thing for Christ-like men seeking Christ-like ministry to feel these pressures and these pains. But the pattern that we have and the one who can lift us up, help us on, clear our eyes, warm our hearts, refresh our affections, direct our zeal, restore our strength to go from this conference back into the battle and to be able to say in effect week after week after week, it does not matter what you say, it does not matter what you do, God helping me, you will not stop me loving you. And there may be nights when you weep yourself to sleep. Father, expand my heart so that I might love these people the way you love them. And if you could hear God's voice, he might be saying in effect, what do you think I'm doing now? <laughs> I'm stretching your soul, my son. I'm expanding your capacity. And those tears and those groans, I am already answering your prayers because I'm teaching you to love the way I love. I'm teaching you to love the way my son loved. I will help you. I will uphold you. I will enable you to go on loving them. Why? So that under God we might secure the greatest blessings for them. So often you'll hear these echoes of maternal faithfulness and affection in the language of the apostles. What is his joy? It's God's people with Jesus Christ. What does he long for? that they would be rooted and grounded in the truth. Do you hear the language of affectionate, motherly love? I want you to be born. I want you to be born healthy. I want you to grow up in all things into him who is the head. I want to see you grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. I want to see you come to full maturity as a true child of God. I want to see you walk faithfully with the Lord all your days. And there will be no joy like that of knowing that you have come at last safely to the bosom of your God in heaven. Brothers, let us seek pastoral tenderness. I don't think, I'm confident that I can speak for the men who gave the title to this conference and to all of the brothers who are preaching at it. 
Do not let your faithfulness become coldness, hardness, harshness, a kind of clinical attachment to a set of doctrines, regardless of the impact that it has on men and women. Ministerial faithfulness flows out of a heart of love. The love of men who have been touched by the love of God and have learned to reflect and communicate that love to others. And who in their pastoral trustworthiness have learned to be faithful like a mother, marked by pastoral gentleness and tenderness, Christ-like in their affections, full of concern, full of generosity, ready to sacrifice, stimulated and sustained by love for the people of God. Amen. Okay, pa- thank you very much, Pastor Jeremy. And uh, what would have been difficult to conceptualize, we are made to understand by that vivid analogy of a motherly uh, of a mother's love which is what we are called to exercise to our brethren we have time for two questions anyone yes um, good morning pastor sir jeremy and pastor noel i'm romaric guerrero again from reformed baptist church of pampanga and hope I can solicit also an answer from Sir Pastor Noel later. In the secular and political environment, we hear and have witnessed the damaging results in the community, families if a leader tends to abuse his exercise of authority over his people. And this is my question. How much authority should the pastor exercise pastoral authority over his congregation or church members? that some have become impersonal, overly dominant, irrational, and legalistic. Thank you. Are you talking, brother, are you, are you speaking specifically of their family life or more generally? More generally. He said you could answer as well if you wanted. <laughs> This may be one of those areas where there needs to be an outworking of what Paul said about becoming all things to all men, that he might by all means win some. So you will need, I don't think in that sense, there's a, there's a principle to apply, but there is no blanket answer to that. Because different people will have different experience, different circumstances, different history. Um, we're talking also about different cultures. So, if I, in, in the congregation which I serve, we have a number of people from a number of different nations in the world. Um, it doesn't directly apply to this question, but so, if 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 I were standing at the door and some British people come in, that the way I show my loving affection toward them to shake their hand like this. There are other people from other cultures that if I did that to them, they would wonder what what the problem was. They need a warm embrace. If I try and embrace one of the British people, they'll think I'm trying to kill them. (laughs) So my point is that I need to take account of the way those people are. And it's not just British, say, versus... Romanian or something. There will be people with different experiences. Some, some British people will come from a home perhaps where everything was very rigid and cold and distant. Others will have had a very warm and affectionate relationship. So I need to distinguish between the kinds of people that I'm dealing with. Some people will welcome me into their, into their lives. They will give me an open door. They will say, in effect, Pastor, if, if I need to hear something, please come and tell me. Now, they don't always mean that. They may think they do, but when I have to be faithful to them, 
they may find that they perhaps overextended the invitation in their estimation. And I need to ask for wisdom from heaven to discern that. So there may be somebody who has these kinds of challenges, who's becoming distant, and, and I need to go after them. But I need to do that with pastoral tenderness. I have to be patient and patient and patient because if I go too fast and too hard, they will go back even faster. There are, there are some people, you know, if, let's say somebody doesn't come to church for three weeks. There are some people, if I call them up after, if they miss one or two Sundays, I might call them up. And the way I do this is important. Because I can either, where were you on Sunday? It sounds like we were taking a register in school. I said, brother, we really missed you on the Lord's Day. Are you doing okay? Now, some people, if they're not there, and you don't call them up, they will be very upset. You don't love me. You didn't, you didn't care where I was. Some people, if you call them up, why are you chasing me down? And then it gets really complicated because the people who say, why are you chasing me down? So you say, well, the next time they're missing, I'll give them a little bit longer. And then you call them up and they say, why didn't you call to see how I was doing? <laughs> because we're dealing with, with people who are complex and sometimes they are wounded and sometimes they are bruised. You know what it's like if someone has been, been injured and the site is very tender? And, and you want to do them good, but ooh, it's, it's, it's too harsh. So you have to exercise unusual tenderness and patience. So all of that to say that we do have a responsibility for everything that the Scriptures give us a responsibility for. We have to be careful that we do not intrude into things where God has not said that we have a responsibility. Let me give you an example. If I'm doing a pastoral visit, I might ask somebody, especially if I know that they've struggled with this or, or, or things have been a challenge, it might be appropriate, it would be appropriate at least from time to time to say, are you able to maintain your giving to the church? Have you established a, a pattern of generous contributions in accordance with your circumstances to the kingdom of God? What I can't say is, I'd like to see your bank accounts and see what you've given to the... That's, that's not my business. I don't have... I have a right to ask about these things. Um, it would be appropriate for me to ask, for example, are you and your wife or you and your husband... Yeah, are, you, are you maintaining a, an affectionate and close relationship toward one another? It is not my place to ask always what that looks like. and what they, I don't need the details, but I do want to know that there's warmth and marital affection. And then if there's a problem, I have to deal sensitively with that. So I cannot go beyond the bounds of Scripture and take to myself an invasive sort of authority and responsibility. The bounds of my pastoral duty are set by the Word of God. But within that, it's not only that I have a, an authority, I actually have a responsibility. So you think again of the parent example. Suppose you have a, a child who, living in your home, shuts the door to their bedroom and says, Dad, Mum, you are not allowed in my bedroom. It's not your bedroom, son. I, I sometimes, I shocked the young people in our congregation not long ago. We were talking about using their, their devices, and I asked some of them, your, your tablet, your smartphone, whose is it? Oh, it's mine. I said, no, it's not. It's Dad's, it's Mum's. That's not a private device. Now, I'm not saying that I can then demand the phone of any member of the congregation, but my point is that just because someone says to a pastor, you can't come here, 
doesn't mean I don't have a duty of care about what's going on behind the door. What I may need to do is then to ask, how do I get the door to open? That's not usually going to be kicking it down. It might be that I sit outside the door for a few hours, talking, encouraging, affirming, declaring and showing my love. What I want is not to reach the point of crisis. See, the people that you're talking about have already reached a point where there's a distance. My pastoral goal is to live and to love in such a way that that distance doesn't develop. Because if I'm now thinking, okay, now they're distant, now they're cold, now they're legalistic, something's already gone wrong. So I want to start here, keeping God's people close. And then if I need to go further, I'm thinking, how can I do this in such a way that I draw them towards me rather than repel them from me? But the bounds of that are established by what God's Word says about where pastoral responsibility begins and ends. Thank you. We'll take the last question from online. Uh, from Lito Ruiz, would you consider a pastor who preaches regularly but does not have regular oversight of the members of his church or selective with his oversight ministerially unfaithful? Would you equate the work of preaching with pastoral oversight? How would you advise such a pastor? I'll try and deal with this in some measure tomorrow specifically. But just to, to give you a text that may help in this regard, notice, notice the language here. We were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. The implication, all of them. And then further on, you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. Brothers, we do not have the liberty to be selective in our faithfulness. So there is, there may be some people who need more care, but there's no one who needs no care. You know, there may be an, a, an older saint or a widow, a uh, recently widowed woman or, or someone who's got long-term sickness and you might make a visit to them every month whereas there'll be other people in the congregation that you might see every six months or every year but you cannot make any exceptions in that sense. Again, remembering those questions of pastoral awareness and sensitivity. But remember that in part, your pastoral credibility rests on them knowing you and you knowing them. And so there has to be some measure of engagement. So I think it would be neglectful if... And it's difficult, especially if you've got a larger congregation and there aren't many elders. But I would say, ideally, in the course of any given year, you should be spending time with each member or family in your congregation to get a little more in-depth with them. And I, use, I say to people, some people are very afraid of this. I once made a pastoral... I asked somebody, can I come and visit you? And they put me off for about six months. And I began to have to, look, I, I really do need to come and talk to you. I and, and they became even, and eventually I said, look, I, I just, are you, what, what are you worried about? Well, they said in, in the last church we were a part of, the only reason a pastor ever came to talk to us was when there was a problem that he was going to deal with. I said, I'm so, I had no idea. You know, I almost wept. You know, these people thought that I was going to come and start church discipline or something with them. They were, what's he going to say? I said, no, no, this, this is like a, a GP's annual checkup. It's, it's not because I know you're sick and I've got some horrible medicine. I, I want to make sure you're doing okay. I want to know how things are with you so that I can care for you more effectively. And if you've started to feel some aches or pains or chills, then I can know how I can care for you. So yes, you need to be regularly visiting across the board. You you do a lot of your pastoral work from the pulpit but it cannot be exclusively from the pulpit 
Shepherding is more than preaching. Pastoring is more than teaching. If you ever see a shepherd at work, he is not standing at a distance from the sheep with a catapult, loading food in and pinging it out to the corners of the field. He is among the sheep. Remember First Peter, uh, First Peter that the, the flock of God which is among you. Uh, you. You're not talking to people over there. You're amongst the sheep. You've got your fingers in the wool. You're trying to learn what are their, what's their condition. Are they wounded? Are they injured? Are they diseased? What particular care do particular sheep need? So yes, if you are not closely engaged with the lives of God's people, you will be in danger of neglect. And that's going to involve more than simply appearing in the pulpit on the Lord's Day and then disappearing out as soon as you've finished. You need to be available and accessible. Otherwise, are you living and loving like a mother? <laughs> you wouldn't say a mother is, is showing faithfulness and tenderness if she, you know, she throws some food on the table and that's all the time the children ever see her. She's involved in their lives. A father is involved in the lives of his children and so must we be.